open session meeting now. I understand that we have one uh, sign up to address the board. Uh, Mr. Steve Murphy, is he here? City Council is in open session, by the way. Not in Okay, uh, we'll uh, I've got just a few highlights here from the written materials. Uh, um, could, I, could I ask uh, if we're if we're doing uh, our presentations that we use the microphone and all that so uh, everybody can hear? I mean, that's a good idea. I have to remember the average agent here. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can stand up there and talk loud. I don't know if we even have a microphone. Yet. Or if we get the broadcast. Where's our PIO person? If we just uh, <laughs> Well, if Don and I would leave you off the list. Well, I, I don't know. I think I was the one. That's the next question. Maybe I'm telling you the microphone. No, no. I'll just talk really loud. How's that? I think part of it is keeping your voices up. You know, when you do public speaking, you got to keep your voices up and don't let them trail off so that we hear the first half and not the second half of what I said. So. If anyone has trouble hearing me, please raise your hand and I will try to keep my voice up. <laughs> what did you say? Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. You've got to have somebody do that, right? Yeah. Okay, on page 10 of the uh, written report, uh, we've, we've got some informa information in there about some of the uh, content that, we, that Matt has put on our uh, social media pages and different different avenues uh, one story that he put on there was had to do with the emergency operations center and of course we've been activated a number of times over the last few months and I think City Council had a meeting out there which was I'm not, I haven't heard I think Richard was out there I'm not sure how that went but I guess it was everybody got to see the facility it's a great facility you ever have ever have an opportunity to get out there and check it out I'm sure Mr. Parchman would be happy to give you a tour. Uh, works really well in these storm situations. So that was one story. Uh, we have had a number of uh, TV stories and things like that as well. So mainly having to do with storm-related outages, smart smart metering, or as Matt Matt doesn't like to refer to it as that, he calls it advanced metering infrastructure. And then the uh, work on 82nd, we had some uh, coverage on that as well. On, uh, on page 15, <coughs> uh, quite a bit of information on our websites now about AMI. We're trying to communicate with our folks, uh, customers, as effectively as we can. Of course, the, uh, Mr. Bertram will talk about the status of the AMI here in a minute. Uh, but we are communicating with our public in, in all the different avenues that we have. And so even trying to respond to requests that customers send us about things like, in this case, my drop came loose from my house. Well, they could have called the, the trouble number, but instead they put it on Facebook and we responded to it. So uh, we're trying to be proactive and, and responsive to customer requests regardless of how they come in. On page 16, some of the uh, information there, uh, outage causes and system interruption duration index. You can see March was uh, the highest month we've had in quite some time in terms of outages. That was all related to the, the March wind event where we had 26 poles, I think it was, that, that came down and a number of pretty significant outages, feeder outages. Uh, we're going to 
We're going to report here in a minute on the April outage as well. Um, Mr. McGinnis will talk about that a little bit. It wasn't nearly as bad. I'll give you a little preview. Uh, on page 18, the uh, with regard to the call center, we met our uh, key performance indicators this month or for the past month, uh, <clears throat> which you can see in the notes at the bottom of the page there. And our meter reading error rate was met our targets as well, so good work there in both of those groups. Uh, average wait times are, are improved. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was, had to do with construction report, and I wanted you to look at page 27. We've had 15 new commercial requests in the month of, in the month of uh, March. Uh, pretty, pretty, uh, a lot of a lot of growth happening in Lubbock. A lot of new commercial activities. This is putting a strain on our engineering department primarily at this point, but it will put put a strain on our underground department in the future. And I know there have been some uh, lead times. Uh, we've had some complaints from some of our commercial developers with, with, with regard to the del delays and some of our uh, response, getting new buildings hooked up, and getting the underground work put in. We are, when you see the budget later this year, you'll see that we've added, uh, we've proposed to add an additional underground crew. One of the things that we're doing, try to, trying to respond to this uh, heavy growth that we're seeing, good economy, great things happening in Lubbock. It's, it's all good, but we just, we, we need our workforce to keep up with this with the changes. So uh, at that point, I will let Mr. McGinnis give a brief report on the, on the April. Uh, questions. Just one question. In, in terms of the workforce keeping up with it, are we uh, competitive in the engineering and underground departments uh, where we need people in I will say this, we're more competitive now, now with our lineman wages than we have been. We, we requested an increase in salary for our journeyman lineman because we've had several journeymen leave in, in just the last few months. Uh, Mr. Atkinson was kind enough to give us uh, a pretty significant increase in our journeyman, entry level journeyman wage, which we we think is going to help a lot in being able to retain journeyman, journeyman lineman both overhead and underground. and. Uh, Thank you for doing that and doing it so quickly, by the way. Uh, and, and I've also heard reported yesterday, uh, Kip McCall, the manager of our transmission distribution group, told me that they've got another journeyman uh, lineman application out on the street and we've already got some referrals, some additional referrals on that that we, we hadn't been seeing many, many referrals on these new positions that have been posted, so I think the higher wage that, that is there now is going to help with regard to recruiting and retaining Journeyman lineman, which you know, mission mission critical for us to have qualified journeyman. How many design engineers do you have? Uh, design engineers. Uh, people that work on the projects that you just described. Construction groups, approximately nine and ten people. <clears throat> and there's some strain in that group. We really most of that is managed by engineering technician level people, not not That's engineers. Right. Engineers are available for you know for support. Uh, and I guess we've got about eight degreed engineers in the group right now as well. So we've been able to recruit entry-level engineers. We've had trouble recruiting, you know, PEs, senior-level engineers, to answer to answer your other question. Uh, Mr. Connor, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just looking at the project helping hand again. Um, do we have, I guess so, did we gain any rate pairs for 2018 to 2019? We're, yes, we have drawn our number, our customer base. I think we're up close to 106,000 now. Is that right? That's right. So we've had some large apartment complexes come in, and a lot of it's students, student housing, but we've grown the number of customers served. But I'm assuming our uh, pledge, uh, I guess, pledges for the project helping hand had I'm just trying to get some kind of correlation here. For our customer base, and our customer base has grown. You know why is this number in exactly? Why is this number turning down uh, rather than up? Good question. I don't. I don't know the answer to it. I, I will say this: that Ms. Henry is in charge of our 
Project Helping Hand Committee, and I know she wants to have a committee meeting in the near future to talk about things that we can do. So. And, and for my shop, we, we put a lot of information out there, social media, on search, and search. You know, we do that, like I say, at least monthly in terms of what we put out on social media, and at least quarterly in terms of what gets sent out with bills. As we get around the first of summer, we increase our efforts. As we get around the holidays, we increase our efforts. Jamie's group also had... The uh, customer's been actively pushing it as well. Yes. The customers that call in. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've, had, they've had a project going on to try to, you know, every call that they have, try to get folks to, who aren't signed up to sign up to the Roundup. Uh, we just we continue to see, you know, this, this decrease. Another thing is, people are not, number one, I'm not sure how many people actually look at the insults in the door, but also people are not getting I mean, these. People are paying, you know, how long they're paying. is to talk briefly about the April uh, event. And by the way, I was just going to, before he does that, I have a, uh, we've had four EOC activations where we were involved and then another some EOC activations for uh, for the NCAA tournament last week. But uh, we had a winter storm December 7th through 9th. We had a wind event on September 23rd. We had wind and thunderstorm Tuesday, March 12th. That was really the biggest, biggest one which I think we reported on at the last board meeting. And then the, the most recent event was a uh, wind event on April, April 10th. So it's been a windy start of the year. I'll add one day to David's list, and that was April the 5th. That was a Friday. I think that was just a small stun thunderstorm that came through. Uh, so the last couple of events that we've had, uh, April the 5th, and April the 10th was last Wednesday. April the 5th was a thunderstorm. Uh, I think the EOC was three to four hours, uh, just in anticipation of, of some of the winds that were accompanying the, the thunderstorm. The April the, the 10th, which was last Wednesday, was another high wind day. Uh, the winds were not quite as high as what they were on April the or the March the 12th. So. We saw winds or gusts that were somewhere in the low 60s uh, in that range. Sustained was uh, probably 45 to 50, somewhere in there. Uh, the EOC was activated. We uh, There was three individuals, myself, Chris Sims, Tina Cooper from, from LPNL that manned the EOC. Uh, we, did, we pulled four-hour shifts, so we're trying to bring some other folks in to uh, relieve David to help the day-to-day -day operation. So that, that worked fairly successful. Uh, during the outage that day, we had uh, 25 outages. Uh, I think there were 710, 715 uh, customers affected uh, at one time or another during the day. Um, I think the biggest one was like 608, uh, 608 customers on one, one circuit, but uh, that was restored in, in fairly quick amount of time. Uh, the rest were just ones and you know tens and twelves that, that were affected during the day for the high wind. Most of the outages were wind, uh, tree limb related, uh, you know, things that were pulled off the side of the house, those, those type of activities. Uh, number of poles. I don't have an exact number of poles. 
uh, but they really didn't affect too many of the outages. I think that uh, March the 12th kind of called a lot of the, the bad poles. <laughs> We had 70 mile an hour gust in that one. <laughs> so we, we did have some, some poles pushed um, on the, Mar the April the 10th date, but uh, um, very few. So. Any other details? Uh, yes, ma'am. In these wind events, is there any particular uh, part of the city that's affected more than others? Not really. We. Well, the underground areas are the, the underground areas, you are correct. The underground areas are not affected um, as as much as what the... Well, we've had a lot in District 6, is all I'm saying to you. We've had a lot of outages in North and Northwest. We, we can take the, the, the outages and put those on a GIS map and, and you know see if we can run some, some type of analysis or... or well, see if there's this, anything in a higher area. Sorry to interrupt, but see, see if there's anything in certain areas. That, well, you would assume that some of it is just older equipment, older poles, that sort of thing. But we do have more uh, more problems in the areas where there's established trees, large trees. As, as uh, you mentioned, the tree limbs are a major problem during the wind events. And also where we have secondaries. A lot of the old overhead areas have secondaries, and those secondaries start bouncing flopping together and the tree limbs get into those secondaries cause small outages but a lot of outages. So yeah, but I would say the older areas of town are more vulnerable. Larry, I know there was uh, there was something around McCullough Station last Wednesday too, wasn't there? <coughs> I think that was last Wednesday too. Uh, that where we're where we're redoing that, seems like they had a they had an outage up there. You know, that particular substation is is like I said, one of the older neighborhoods that have uh, large trees, and there are secondaries in a lot of those areas. So uh, we do experience a lot of problems out at the substation for sure. And to, to Blair's point, I can't remember which attitude it was, but we had a lot of problems. <coughs> like for example, in the rush area, and so after that, you know, we took those Aspen crews and said, "You guys need to." go in there and make sure you clear all of that out. As you can expect, we've gotten stuff on social media where people are like, enough already with the tree trimming. But we just have to reinforce and say, I know you might say that today, but come the storm, it's imperative that we have this cleared off the line. So we have gotten some blowback from that area. Well, if they were uh, able to financially, they would be better off to hire their own I've seen some of the evidence of what S1 does. And with those older trees, you start cut, cutting the middles out, and it's kind of ugly looking. So that, that people have to know they're coming. I don't know if you let them know that, hey, we're getting ready to trim they, the trees they in do. your alley uh, if you want to do it yourself. They have door hangers, and they, they okay. knock on doors. <laughs> I can't believe you're suggesting that as all the to be told the ELC under certain conditions. But do you have the facilities at the ELC that you used to have over on municipal field as far as operations like SCADA and everything else? How, how do you interact with those? I'm curious. Yes, we, we actually, our primary dispatch center it is at the EOC. We also have a backup control center at the Hill. And, and that that was the primary up till so you have the necessary equipment at the EOC mm -hmm. to do it to take over the operations. I guess I don't understand well, where you direct traffic. We get clearances from what have you. Yes, absolutely yes. The dispatchers are in the EOC. We call it the EOC, but it's the EOC LPNL control room. They are located inside the EOC along with fire dispatch, along with the EOC personnel. Uh, so yes. Do they you maintain a crew at the, on the municipal hill too? No. You, you no, sir. Got away from that. Yes, sir. Okay. We do have a backup facility there in case the primary goes down, but that facility is really hardened. It's got multiple sources. 
communications coming into it, backup power. So it's really a hardened facility and really works well for the uh, dispatch center to be out there. Mr. McCall, if you'd like to have a meeting out there, we'd be glad to host you. You, you know, we took a city council meeting out there. It's the best internet in the city. <laughs> no, seriously, if you'd like to have a meeting out there, we'd be more than happy to host you out there. We've got the facilities to do it, and, and we like to. We want to raise the awareness in, in the community about what's the investment we all made in. Thank you. I know for some of you guys, you've been spending plenty of time out there. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. We're working on a room, a room out there where Matt Rose can go smoke his pipe, you know, while he's out there. You know, something's happening. Yeah. Have a shoe shine and things like that. Are you kidding? To answer your question, Mr. Boatman, yes, they can control the SCADA. They have all the capabilities that they had at the Hill. That's what I wanted. Yes. Switching orders. It's all there. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for my report, unless there's any more questions. Okay. And then go to item number seven. Uh, Mr. Burke. All right. Oh, we got about my one fifteen here. Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't quite done yet. I apologize. Uh, so we're, we're still reporting on the things that are, that are ongoing with regard to the 115 KV upgrade project. Uh, so there's the, the main projects that are going on. We've got a couple of action items on your agenda that will uh, uh, approve the next, next phases of uh, work. So Chocolate Oliver is, for all intents and purposes, complete. There's a few punch list items yet, yet to be done out there. Uh, McDonald's substation will be the first of the three substations that will be energized. It's uh, moving along very well. And uh, <coughs> the traction and control wiring being installed, power cables. Uh, they're to the point of putting gravel down and leveling it out. So, you know, that's usually the last phase of the project. Uh, here's some of, the, some of the pictures of some of the work that's going on out there. You can see the grate around the transformer. That's... Uh, you've got a little containment area there if we develop an oil spill that holds holds the oil in because there's a lot of oil in these transformers. Uh, some of the bus work that you can see there in the gravel. And this is kind of the, the major work here recently has been in the control, control panels, the panel wiring, relaying wiring, and then uh, cables going into the transformer as well. So. Uh, we hope to have this substation energized in the next few weeks. So they're working on some commissioning activities right now, so uh, that's, that's the plan on that one. Slayton substation, uh, coming along very well as well. Uh, jumper in installation from uh, breaker bushings, uh, grounds installed, and then in installation of breakers and bus work. Some of, the, some of the work that's going on. This was in, installation of one of the breakers, some of the bus work. They use these little lifts out there to, to get up. I think they actually, when the winds got so high, they had to shut down for a while last, last week. And that's kind of the, the finished breaker lineup there, the bus work and the breakers in the lineup. So it's coming along. It's probably still a couple of months away from being, being complete. And then Red Raider substation is will probably be the last of the three to be completed. They're still doing some site work there, pouring concrete for, for some of the piers, uh, wall sections, uh, steel columns. The control building is on site. And the oil set, oil, the transformers have been filled with oil and tested. <coughs> so here's the porch for the control building. Uh, I think this picture was taken last when we had the, the, the wind nice event. <laughs> so I like that just to show, you know, kind of the, the color of the sky matched the color of the wall, so I thought that was good. Uh, and some of the columns that are being installed and some more of the fence work. So that's kind of where that one's at. <coughs> any, any questions?
All right, what I wanted to do today is to give you all an update on um, our plans on how we will finance our capital program this year. It's uh, different than what we've done either at LPNL or at the city uh, in the past, and so I wanted to explain it to you. This is not anything that we'll be bringing to the Electric Utility Board for approval. It will be going to the council since uh, indebtedness uh, is under the council's purview, but I definitely wanted the board to, to understand what our recommendation will be. So I'm going to introduce you to a term called the Direct Purchase Revolving Note Program. Uh, it is a product uh, that uh, we will have negotiated with uh, Bank of America. Uh, and I'll go through a little bit of it, uh, help you understand what, what we're going to be doing. Historically, for all of our uh, portions of our capital program that we finance with debt, we've issued long-term fixed rate bonds. Uh, and Basically, we'll issue the bonds, all the cash comes in on day one, and we spend that cash over a period of time. Uh, so it's, it's always issued in advance. However, due to you know some of the timing events of the ERCOT uh, construction and, and all of that, we wanted to ensure flexibility. One of the things when you issue bonds is you will have, you set in stone a first payment date. And so we wanted to make sure that we had some flexibility on that first payment date. So we can match that first payment date with our first transmission cost of service revenue stream that would come in to match that. So that provides us with the most flexibility. So our intent is to utilize this revolving note program over the next couple of years to finance our projects. So that way, instead of having the cash come in on day one and we spend it as we go, this we just draw on those funds as we need them, as those expenditures are made. It's kind of just-in-time financing. Um, and, and the last bullet, basically what I mentioned a moment ago, we can tailor our first payment date with our re receipt of revenues from ERCOT. So what we did back in the fall, we put together a group of us, uh, finance at LPNL, the finance at the city, uh, RBC Capital Markets, which is our financial advisor, and ORC, which is our bond council. We worked on an RFP uh, for this, what we called at the time, an interim lending facility. We issued the RFP on October the 25th and received responses close to the end of November. We received a, a very nice sampling of proposals of many different varieties. Uh, so eight financial institutions uh, proposed and four of those actually submitted two different proposals each. We ultimately selected Bank of America with their direct purchase revolving note program. We've been negotiating the terms of that over the last several <coughs> months and finally really as of Yesterday, uh, we, we, we have a final contract in place uh, and have worked in work. Our bond council has been instrumental in, in working with us and helping us through that process. The program will allow us to make draws at a short-term interest rate. It will help us to match our cash flows uh, to our needs for construction, like I mentioned, and then also, again, matching our first payment date with our transmission revenues. Uh, we will not have any repayment obligation throughout the term, so we will basically be capitalizing that interest, rolling that interest forward until we're able to fix out this program with long-term bonds in 2021. Once we go live into ERCOT, then we will <laughs> fix out these the short-term borrowing with long-term bonds. <coughs> By doing this in our financial model, we had, when we had originally anticipating it, anticipated issuing fixed rate bonds, that capitalized interest cost was going to be almost $23 million. By utilizing the note program, it'll only be a little over $13.5 million. So there's a good bit of savings uh, related to that capitalized interest cost because we're not borrowing a lot of money all, all at the beginning. Uh, Bank of America was chosen uh, for many reasons, uh, most notably uh, they're, they're low cost of funds. They've offered us a rate as, which is 80% of LIBOR uh, plus 34 basis points, well below any of the other proposals that we received. And also the, the high ratings of Bank of America are, are, are good and the flexibility of the program that they offer to us. We do have a meeting. I'm sorry, yes. Just a quick question before you get off the end of training. Is that like 30 day LIBOR or? They have offered, we, we either have 30 day three month, six month, or 12 month. And so we will have that option throughout the program to determine whichever direction we want to go there. So, um, and so we- It's gonna be 80% plus 34 basis mm -hmm, points? That is correct. That's whatever rate we pick. Uh -huh. Yes, so wherever each one of those 
uh, tranches would lie. We 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 take that eighty percent of LIBOR plus plus that. And this this contract it is terminates on December of twenty twenty one. So we've given ourselves an extra six months after our planned integration date in case there are delays. Another reason that it expires on December 31st of 21 is that's when LIBOR basically goes away. And so uh, we, we wanted to terminate it so there's no confusion on what index do we utilize for, for pricing going forward. So if for some reason we had to extend beyond December of 21, we would have to renegotiate a different index. Uh, SOFR is, is anticipated to be the one that will take the place of LIBOR at that point in time. Um, wait. Did I, yeah, I caught everything there. Oh, tomorrow we do meet with Fitch. Uh, this only requires a private rating by one rating agency. Uh, so we are going to be meeting with Fitch. It's a relatively <coughs> informal. It's not like our normal big annual presentation to the rating agencies, but it will be um, uh, an intensive review of this program and our current update on our financials and our capital program. Just to give you an overview, uh, this is an ultimate size of up to 300 million. Um, again, Bank of America is the purchaser of those notes to fund not only our ERCOT interconnection, but also the transmission uh, lines that we're building and really all of our capital needs over the next couple of years. We expect once approved by the, if approved by the council, um, that it will go to the attorney general for their approval. We expect their approval by uh, close to the end of May and would expect that the note program would close on June 5th. That'd be the first opportunity we would have to draw funds out of the program. By state law, we can't issue a note more than 364 days. So even though I said one year, uh, it's one year is equal to 364 days here. So that's the maximum maturity we can have on these individual notes. They are tax exempt and we've gotten the opinion from bond council that our entire program will still fit within the tax exempt hemisphere. Um, we do have the flexibility if there was a need for a uh, taxable barring, which we don't anticipate, but there is some flexibility there for that. These notes are subordinate to our uh, priority lien uh, debt, so uh, in Bank of America agreed to that term and we will be drawing, we, we, I think we can draw up to two times a month, which is sufficient. We more than likely will only be drawing once a month. We will be maintaining a, um, a schedule of, of the expenditures that are taking place and making sure we're, we're covering those as we, as we move on. And I apologize, this is a lot of information on one slide, but I'll, I wanted to give you an example of, of what we're anticipating this program looking like. On the left hand, you'll see that's actually the for this example is utilizing six month LIBOR rates, which you see here in the two and a half to three and a half percent range over the next couple of years, eight, uh, 30 months or so. The adjustment of the rate doing eight percent of LIBOR plus the 34 basis points is in that second column going from about 2.48 percent to about 3.06 uh, percent. We have an estimated draw schedule today, which will change. It's already wrong probably right now, but the, this, this column right here shows what draws we anticipate. So it's pretty significant monthly draws. The, uh, the largest month we're anticipating almost 30 million uh, at, at a point in time once we're really having a lot of the uh, ERCOT uh, construction underway. Um, so you can see about 286 million will be available for actual construction. 13.5 million will be designated for estimated interest costs. So that, that would help get you up to that 300 million if, if it costs that much. And remember that these are estimated costs. We're, we're hopeful that we'll come under these costs, but this is um, looking at the high end of, of what we're expecting. So uh, for one thing that we do pay is an undrawn fee. So when we don't draw money out of this program, we do pay I believe it's 25 basis points. So you can see those fees at the beginning. Uh, we, we have a quarterly amount around $150,000 to $175,000. Once we've drawn over half of the note program up, uh, up to $150 million, Bank of America agreed to eliminate that draw, undrawn fee so that goes to zero. So over the course of this um, program, we'd anticipate six, about 600000 in undrawn fees in addition to the $13.5 million in interest. Then we have paying agent fees, a little under 40000 And so that uh, kind of gives you an idea 
of the cost involved. But again, this is significantly less than what we would have paid under a bond issuance, and it gives us a significant about, amount of additional flexibility. There are other fees that we pay, bond council fees, financial advisory fees, but all in all, total of about $14.6 in costs related to this program, um, and again, significantly less than if we'd issue bonds. So just wanted to give you an update, and if you got any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Mr. Taylor, so Andy, we've discussed several times the GASB deal on capitalized interest for enterprise activities. <coughs> got them to sign off on that, capitalizing the interest on that's going to be? Yes, uh, Ranu had done some research on that and um, was comfortable that we fell within that. And and then also, I don't think it was invited by you, but we got an email from uh, Weaver, I'd say last, a couple last weeks, last week or a couple weeks ago, saying, hey, we have investigated a little bit deeper and discovered Good. this exclusion for a regulated that, that, utility. That was one of those phrases that got repeated several times about the yeah. not being able to capitalize yeah. so, so, so as far as I know at this present time, there, there will be no change in how we handle Good. capitalized interest on our books and what we've done in the past. That's yeah. All right. Any other questions on the, the revolving note program? Yes, Just one question. You said the costs are 14.6 I don't have them all with me today, but just the just the capitalized interest alone was twenty almost twenty three million under the bond issuance, and so even just that alone, you can see the difference in the cost related between. You. I, I don't have all the other full amount, but you're not paying a you know a full interest a long term fixed rate interest rate you know on. Um, all that money at the, from the very beginning. Anyway, thank you. I'm now going to turn over to Chad to go over the monthly. Thank you, Chad. Um, I'll go ahead. All right. As we as we do every month, um, we'll start with uh, our, our pass through rate. Um, just communicate um, how that's doing. Um, and so, as you know, we have seasonal rates, and so uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of our, our winter rates. Uh, May will be the last month. We'll set new rates going into June. Uh, we're at $111.27. We always layer in Excel or just a little shy of $105. And then the survey average uh, across the state um, is just shy of $107. So, a um, little bit higher than both of them, but uh, we'll be looking at rates in the next uh, 45 days to bring a, a recommendation to you all uh, to, to adopt for June 1st. On the income statements, revenues relative to year end are down about 3.3 million. Um, the driver of that is purchase power <coughs> rates. Um, as, as we've talked about all year long, natural gas prices are significantly lower than uh, we anticipated, and so our purchase power uh, revenues are also lower. Uh, just for context, our base rates are within $300,000 of where they were <coughs> at the same time last year. So uh, that tells us that our volumes and that our, our rate model uh, that develops our base rates is, is working. So on the operating expense, um, you can see purchase power is, is our big driver, um, and then supplies, maintenance, and other um, is really driven by uh, lower engineering uh, engineering costs that we had spent um, on ERCOT-related stuff, legal uh, costs that we had spent on uh, the ERCOT cases, and then uh, we had, when we switched over to Cooper, we had some lagging uh, printing costs uh, that, that were in last year's financials that are not in this year. So, um, anyway, about $4.2 million uh, in net income through the month of February, which is a pretty big improvement over the same time. Uh, oh, excuse me. Yeah, same time last year. Balance sheet. Um, cash is up $8.5 million. Primarily as a result of the deferred revenue that we'll talk about on the liability side of the balance sheet in a second. Um, 
Receivables are also down, you can see, uh, quite a bit, uh, which is normal for this time of year. It's due to the seasonality of cooler temperatures, which, um, you know, all translates and rolls through our uh, receivables <coughs> and revenues. Um, CapEx, you can see, compared to year-end, CapEx has really taken off um, more so than it has in prior years. <coughs> Uh, through the month of February, we've spent just over $14 million uh, in capital expenditures. On the liability side of the balance sheet, accounts payable and due to, uh, it's made up of the WTMPA uh, payable, uh, which is only down about, I'd say only, it's about a million dollars uh, lower than it was at year end. Uh, the rest of it is just AP and just as in the course of business, you can't really predict AP. It just depends on what's due at the time, and it's, it's about $4 million lower uh, than it was at year end. Deferred revenues, um, as you can see, as it relates to the PPRF and the FFE, is, is up $10.8 million. Deposits are up about 400000 and that's as a result of the tariff change that we made uh, as it relates to deposits. Uh, you can see here, uh, oh, excuse me, excuse me, uh, bonds payable. We made our CO debt payment in February, uh, and that went down three, three point one million dollars. We always like to show you how we're doing on budget, and you can see uh, metered revenues are down. It's the same story from the income statement. Uh, purchase power revenue, expenses are down, purchase power revenues are down as a result. All other revenues are up significantly relative to the uh, same time last year. And again, it goes back to natural gas. Um, when you have really cheap gas, it makes our plants much more attractive to the market. And so we have run uh, the plants a lot more than, than anticipated. And so. Um, we have more revenue, but that also translates to a little bit higher fuel costs um, in our production department. So, um, on the expense side, you can see that admin is down quite a bit from last year, and transmission is down quite a bit from last year. It's the same story that we're talking about in the income statement. It's primarily um, outside legal and um, engineering costs that we uh, expent last year that. Um, you know, we're not incurring those costs this year, but overall revenues are tracking um, a little bit greater than expenses. Capital program, we've got 72 open projects. Um, as you're all aware, we've got a big capital program. Um, we've got about 175 million that we've still uh, got remaining appropriated, but you can see um, this lines up with the balance sheet. We're starting to see um, some pretty big expenditures uh, in the month of February. I mean, 6.3 may be, if not the highest, one of the highest months that I've seen uh, in terms of capital expenditures in any one given month. And so um, you can see some of the projects that Mr. McCullough was showing you <coughs> pictures of. You can see the corresponding dollars um, starting to be spent on those projects. So that's all I have. Uh, happy to answer any questions. So, Chad, on the page 30 on the uh, income statement, uh, I'm just I'm looking at the transfers out, mm -hmm. and is that is the franchise fee down because we're billing less, or is that our catch-up deal we did last year on the census tariff? I mean, I actually had that in my notes to talk about, and I guess oh, okay. I skipped it. No, I, I, I missed okay. it, so I'm glad you got um, Yeah, franchise fees are lower. That is part of it, a okay. franchise fee and pilot, because our revenues are down. Uh, but the big piece of it is, if you'll recall, we had a, a one-time catch-up right. for our piece of Citizens Tower debt. It was a double. Uh, right. It was a two-year deal. Right. Yeah. And so now that that is current, we're just paying this year's portion. And so transfers will be less. Okay. Because I was, I was looking at that, and I'm like, okay, our income statement looks better but our transfers are less and I understand our billings are, our billings are flat on 
that one, but on the budget one, it's actually down. Yeah. So, okay. And then, and then you pointed it out, I guess, just on the state of the cash flow. Uh, CapEx, total CapEx, bond funded and cash funded for the year is, is $21.2 million fiscal year to date. Right? right. So, yeah. Yeah, I think just for anybody keeping score at home, um, CapEx divided by depreciation, you always want it to be at least one so that uh, you're your fixed assets, um, you're not losing value, so you want to keep investing. Um, I think for the month of February, it was three. So just to give you some context of the investment that we're making relative to the depreciation that's rolling off the books. So. Okay. Thank you. Bring us to item eight, which is to discuss activities concerning the West Texas Municipal Power Agency. And I believe that's all to you, Mr. Captain. I'll, I'll make some just brief introductory comments. I've got a, uh, I've got a call from one of the uh, TMPA board members uh, from the city of Brownfield, Jeff Davis. Jeff. He, uh, he gently wanted to know if we would consider withdrawing from WTMPA. And the reason being, I think, with with us going our separate ways and power supply now, they've got their deal, we've, we've got our deal. Uh, we're going to ERCOT, they're not. There, there seems to be no need for us to remain in WTMPA, but they would continue, they would like to continue using WTMPA as a vehicle for them to do power supply deals, uh, other, other things that they want to do, like a uh, man, energy management agreement, and things like that. So, uh, so they kind of they don't they didn't want to offend us, but they would like to know. And we've been talking about this for quite some time, so it's no surprise. It's really just a matter of when you, when do you pull the trigger. And so that's really the, what needs to be discussed here: is are we willing to withdraw from WTMPA? Uh, okay. I was just going to add that. Uh the city of Lubbock's membership in West Texas Municipal Power Agency is in the council's jurisdiction. Uh, so we're, we're discussing it in this in our forum here with the Lake Utility Board and the council to the extent that there are council members here. Uh, in the event that the council would like a recommendation from the DMV as far as you know, their, their action. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, it is not posted for any action. It was more just to bring it up and be able to answer any questions or, or, have, or we all provide any staff takeaways that you'd like for us to run down or, or anything of that nature. That, it, it's a, it, it appears to be a large policy decision that hasn't, that hasn't been discussed probably in close to four years. Uh, so I think it was mostly brought up to, to uh, educate the board and the council as to WTP communication and to uh, freshen that debate and uh, with, with the thought process that, that now that the, that the full requirements contract is going to expire in, in, in June, that there no longer is that impediment to uh, to the taking action for what to withdraw from that I just didn't say I've you know, got a lot of discussion about this over the years. And I would say when you, when you feel like you're ready to if I were going to vote today, I'd say, yeah, let's break it into the council, but we can draw, but, you know, maybe something come up, we don't have to draw it out. Can you make this be an item for the next video? You can certainly put that on the list. Well, uh, I can understand why they would want us out. We owe 85%. We have 85% of the voting, right? And they want to go a different direction. We have the ability to say no, they can't do anything. So I think we all have to kind of think about that. Do you want to wield that kind of power or do you want to get out like perhaps good? Um, at least from my perspective, we've been talking about it for about seven years actually, Matumba, and why we were in it and if any expense we had, it's 85% ours. Uh, so I think we would, as a council, I think we would give serious consideration uh, to going ahead and, and following, but I can only speak for me at this time. No, I'm sorry, I, I did 
didn't come prepared to speak in specifics, but uh, the WTPA voting structure is set up where it's not pro rata as to ownership interests. So Lubbock cannot control what WTPA does. There are certain situations in which they possess the ability to, to cause things not to happen, but it's only in certain situations. And so it's not a it's not a pro rata proportionate um, voting right. So to some extent, Lubbock is at the is at the will of, of the entire organization. What about incurring debt? That I think that that require that would require Lubbock's participation. And entering into power purchase agreements was another one of those. I apologize for not coming completely prepared to please about that. Mr. Taylor, to the extent we can discuss it, I guess what so what is their uh, what is their plan for Watanka? Why why do they want to I'm just curious because I don't know that it benefits them either. Well here's keep that entity alive. Well, let me let me uh, address that. I think from the standpoint of the three smaller cities, in order for them to do anything, it would require action of all three cities. If they wanted to do a joint deal, it would require action of all three city councils if, if they didn't have a company. And it's, it's not that that can't be done, it's just not as convenient for them to go take action by individual city councils as opposed to having the TMPA to do it for the, for the entire group. I think it's just a matter of convenience for them. So are they the, in this roughly 100 mile radius, are those the only municipal utilities in that radius besides us? I, mean, uh, now, I think there's a couple of smaller municipals in the Panhandle and in the South Plains area, but I can't remember who they are. And I don't know if there's been any outreach to them about joining them. I think there's provisions in the law that would allow that to happen, but uh, the others might be there. So it does not have utility to, to them, regardless of what we participate in that. I guess that was why I don't think yeah. it was clear on why. You can still have an attorney, you can still have consultants, you can still have accountants working under WTMPA that can be managing the yeah, I think that they too that might give them a little more weight in dealing with their providers. So then my, my, my second question is, as far as legacy liabilities or anything like that, for our participation, is that, how would that work? Yeah. Well, we, we would, it would be our hope and desire that, uh, that all of those legacy encumbrances would be taken care of prior to the dissolution or, or simultaneously with the dissolution of the municipal fire agency. So when it reformed, anything that was, that, that there would basically be a clean slate as concerns the city of Lowell. And, and the, the, the new, the new WTK would be free to, to, to take assignments from the other cities and that, that happened during the wind up process and continue on, on their path. And we stand on our path to see it. But there, Mr. Taylor, there are, there are certain Say a clean slate. Don't know what that means in dollars. <laughs> We're open. I guess we can talk about it. Sure. At this stage, that we know of several existing contractual relationships that will have to be addressed. Uh, those are uh, a, a power purchase agreement, in which we believe we have the ability to address. We believe that we, uh, and we're in the stages, Mr. Jordan, right now, of trying to gather up all of these commitments. But we know there's an operations contract where uh, the city has agreed to perform certain duties and, and, uh, and activities on the part of WTP. There, there is renewable energy credit uh, relationship that we'll have to address if it doesn't terminate on its own. We believe that's one way to look at it might. Uh, there may be other arrangements out there that we'll have to address. But as far as the money goes, I don't think that there is going to be a, a fiscal impact because of the, the, the existing contracts will either we will terminate or be assigned in proportionality, which is largely how we contribute to WTP and pay for those services and products anyway. Does that make any sense? Well, in broad terms, 
it does, the specific terms it does not. What's the dollar amount? Well, let me let me see if I can help. On a couple examples of the contracts, we, right now we, we contract with MCR Performance Solutions. They they're the ones who look at all the FERC filings and SPP filings to make sure that we are not getting harmed. And right now, because we all of those filings, we being Watampa, yes. Okay. Going forward and out of the total requirements contract, we'll only be concerned about our own interest in these filings. And so we can contract directly with MCR to, to handle that. The same thing with the RECs. Today, go for the RECs all go through that WTMP agreement for the, they're for the benefit of all the cities. And so the agency where we you, you broker basically that sells those RECs is for the benefit of all of WTMPA. And today, all of those revenues from a REC stay at WTMPA and stay within their budget. We really don't get direct benefit from those REC proceeds. It's, it's going to help pay for the legal fees and a lot of our share of the cost of WTMPA. But going forward, we, we would want that full benefit to be ours to control not within the, the full scope of, but really today, other than really those rec revenues, the only real thing flowing through WTMPA is their payment on the invoice TSPS and then our payment to them and from the, all the other member cities to reimburse them for that amount. It's really just a flow through mechanism. The four member cities put in their $20 million this month and they write a check to SPS for $20 million and there's a little bit of extra revenue that we that we provide to WTMPA on an annual basis to cover for the legislative, you know, activities and regulatory, you know, coverage and, and that sort of thing. So it's unwinding this to me is there's no harm to the city. There's actually some benefit to it gives us control back to some of these revenues. I guess I'm thinking more in terms of liabilities um, because with the Elk City project, there's a liability that goes with that, correct? Good. Yes, ma'am. Contractual. Mm -hmm. not, not, not a financial, financial, not a financial, not financial liability. Just a contract. Co contractual commitments. We recognize that as an operating expense. Anything that flows to that contract, there's no liabilities recorded on, e on their books or would be on ours. And, and Ms. Joy, to supplement Andy, we would enjoy that now through, through one layer of, of our responsibility to WTMPA. So uh, when we're talking about proportionality assignments and these type of things, uh, and unless I'm missing something, there really shouldn't be much difference between what we owe, what we're responsible for, what we're liable for, and, and in, in a world without Lubbock as a member of WTMPA, in a world with Lubbock as a member of WTMPA. You're just saying the liability for the city is the same in or out. Sooner or later, it's, it's one step or move, but, you know, but we're, we're responsible for taking care of our interest in WTMPA. So. And, and one thing back to your, you, you mentioned a moment ago, the debt, you know, and who, who controls that. You know, there was a thought process back in the late 90s that if WTMPA issued the debt, it would be off the city's books. Well, that was ultimately proven to not be true at all. It was it was our debt ultimately, and so I think what the originators of the WTPA felt that that would be kind of an off books, you know, uh, financing. It was it, it, it was us, and so you know, their rating was our rating. It was it was very communal. So there was ultimately no benefit for having WTPA from that standpoint. Um, and of course, at one point they owned the Mass and Go plant, you know, and, and we ultimately defeased it and, and bought it, you know, from WTPA. So, um, well, over the years, there was found to be little benefit, at least for luck. There, there was benefit certainly for the small member cities, but not so much for us.
to those key things that we have done the research and we feel comfortable with that. I think that's what you're saying. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to pin it down a little bit. It's, it was presented in a very broad manner. Uh, when it comes to us, we're going to be looking for details and specifics. Uh, and a lot of the women, probably, this is all new to them anyway. Uh, so I think it's good to explore in an open discussion. But if we have 85% of it, and I guess pay 85% of the expenses, do we buy at least 85% of the power that goes through there? Or is there some shortage there or some openness? Yeah, that's more. It's 96. I think we bought more. There's a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's a technical term. Beauty. <laughs> <laughs> Do the news. 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 Do the and I, I just might add that I was, these guys were kind enough to brief me on this last week to make sure it says, as a as you may have gotten some information too. As a no, they just gave it to you. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of slow as you know, Mr. Broke. I'm trying to look at all that stuff. Any other questions? Okay, we'll go to number nine. Where we consider re a resolution delegating the authority to the director of electric utilities. They execute non-disclosure or confidentiality agreements on behalf of the city of Lubbock. And uh, we will uh, turn this over to you, Mr. Thank you very much. Um, they, they were, they were, they were, one of the city councils, uh, uh, yeah, no longer in session. The <laughs> <laughs> meeting's adjourned for us. Mr. <laughs> Kessler, do we need a motion to put that on the floor? Yes, sir. I'll, uh, I'll move that we uh, consider the resolution delegating the authority.
I just noted the effective date was March 25th. Mm -hmm. so, that's, that's an intention. Just want to make sure. Any more questions? Thank you.